Such an awesome guy, so mighty, so holy, so wonderful. Such an awesome guy, so selfless, so generous, so. Hey there, I'm so glad you're here. A lot to get to today. First of all, February is Black History Month here in the, in the United States, and I would love to know how you are educating yourself and enriching yourself into the history of Black America, and how perhaps this inspires you in your life with God. It's been inspiring for me to read more about people like Octavia Albert, Charles Octavius Booth, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, for example, or Benjamin Elijah Mays. A Christian today would totally benefit from the profound teaching of Pastor Mays. He lived from 1894 to 1984, and his belief that all people are given a unique assignment from God has helped shape the call of God upon so many uh, to passionately respond that redemption, justice, and empowerment is for all people. If you're, like, if you're a little lost and you need help in your efforts to celebrate the accomplishments of black theologians, I can point you in some resources that have helped me. Just let me know. Today we are both scattered and gathered all over the East Bay as our area churches are not meeting in their normal like large church buildings, but in homes all over. We call it Neighborhood Church, and I want to encourage all of you to participate. If you're not able to meet in the host home, 
nearest you. I hope that you join me in a little bit for Neighborhood Church online right here on Zoom. And you can follow the link on the screen or in the notes or in the chat. I hope to see you there immediately following the message. And today's message is part of uh, our series that will take us through the book of Genesis all the way to, to Easter. This year seems to be like super short. Uh, so let's get started with Steve Ingold. Welcome to Cornerstone Fellowship. Today is a landmark day for the history of our church. As we continue to pursue the direction the Holy Spirit is leading us to develop missional communities compelled by the words and actions of Jesus, we believe that getting Cornerstone Christians together in smaller community, specifically in homes, is one of the best ways for us to get to know one another, know each other's needs, and know the needs of the communities around us, and then to meet those needs. Today, every area and campus of Cornerstone Fellowship is meeting in homes and on Zoom for our once-a-month neighborhood church gatherings. I, I hope you enjoy the conversation, the food, and the connection you are experiencing in this new context. I, I also hope this new context opens up new possibilities, new relationships, and new understandings for you. I, I know for me, neighborhood church has caused me to read parts of Scripture in a completely different way. As I've studied the letters Paul wrote to different, what are, were essentially neighborhood churches, the direction God has Cornerstone going has brought these letters to life in some incredible ways. Paul was literally writing to host homes and people attending those homes and encouraging them, correcting them, and discipling them. This context has helped me understand Paul and his audience's context so much better. You see, context really matters, and not just for where the church gathers. Context matters when it comes to a lot of things in life. What we learn, what we know, what we understand, what we experience are all affected by where we are, when we are, and who we are. Um, for instance, in 19th century England, people believed that arsenic, a super toxic substance, was safe to use in small doses and was incorporated into household goods, food, medicine, and even wallpaper. In the early 18th century, most plagues or epidemics were not believed to be caused by a virus, bacteria, or toxins. Nope. But by vampires, obviously. I mean, everything from left-handed people being accused of affiliating with the devil, ice picks being used as a cure for depression, and carrots giving people superhuman vision, all of these were widely held truths. Without the science, experience, history, and discovery, explanations were given and believed. Context. And I even see this in my own home all the time. Our three-year-old Zakiah is capable of, well, what three-year-olds are capable of. Um, he can't reach certain things, doesn't have the motor skills to do other things, or the cognitive awareness or life experience to really know how things work. But it doesn't stop him from looking at a red light and yelling, go green light, go green light, over and over and over, and then when it finally does turn green, proudly proclaims, I did it. Now, based on his experience and understanding, his context, that kid has the power to turn red lights green. Now, context matters, and this especially holds true when we read Scripture. All of the books written in this collection of books that make up the Bible are at least 1,900 years old. And the last book of the New Testament was written around 95 AD. The first book of the Old Testament, Genesis, was written well before that. And this is part one of a series that takes a look at the book of Genesis from a 30,000 foot view with some drop-ins to ground level. And we'll try to understand Genesis in its context as an ancient story. Failure to grasp this truth is what has led to Genesis being one of the more controversial, misunderstood, and abused books of the Bible. You see, to truly capture what the book of Genesis is all about and what it can teach us, we must study this book in its context, not ours. To look at this text with 
ancient eyes with their beliefs, understandings, and truths about the world. Genesis is an ancient story. It's, it's not a textbook or a book of principles to teach us how to live. It is a story written by and for specific people in a specific culture, written at a specific time. And the best part about stories, with all their twists and turns, ups and downs, accomplishments and mistakes, is that they have the potential to shape our lives. And the best stories present us with both reality and possibility. The characters resonate with us because we can relate to some of what they're going through. We see our story in their story. And it reminds us that we are not alone in whatever it is we're going through. But they also open our eyes to things we are less familiar with. The unknown, sometimes strange and dangerous unknown. Something that shows us not just what is, but what could be. Will you pray with me as we get started today? God, I'm praying and hoping that this series in Genesis is transformative. That as we read this ancient story and understand this story in its context, that um, we can transport ourselves to why this was written, when it was written, how it was written, and the intention behind it. God, ultimately, we just want to know you more. We want to understand the ways you work and move for as much as we can with our limited abilities, but also at the same time to recognize that we are limited and that you are not. So with that, God, we ask and pray that, that, you, that you move through this series, that you shift and transform and change us, and that we would learn how to develop relationships and how to interact with your word in, in ways that maybe we didn't know before. So we surrender all that to you. We trust you. We praise you. We honor you. We glorify you. And we pray all this in the matchless name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, church, I'm, I'm so excited for us to study Genesis together over the next handful of ses sessions we have with one another. So let's dig in. Um, Genesis is one book in a series of books. Scholars call the first five books of the Old Testament the Pentateuch, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Levitic Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The ancient Israelites called these books the Torah. And the climactic moment within Torah is when the God of the Israelites, Yahweh, meets with Israel on Mount Sinai and gives them instructions for how to be his people. This is where they find out who they are as God's people and how to maintain a relationship with God in the land he promised to them. It reminds the Israelites that they are God's people and no other God is worthy of their worship. In the ancient world, worshiping a bunch of other gods was normal. But through the Torah, they are compelled to remain loyal to Yahweh only. Because Yahweh is the creator of the world and the savior of Israel. Genesis focuses on creation and hints at a savior. And much of the Old Testament centers on these two themes. God as creator, God as savior. And this is important as we go through Israel's history because we see constant persecution, defeat, torment, and pain. It's helpful to recognize that more and more scholars believe that the Torah was written in the time of King David and, and not the time of Moses, sometime after 539 BC. And I could go on and on as to why, but the most compelling arguments are that Moses and other characters are spoken about in the third person. This is a story about Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, and the Israelites who left Egypt and went to Mount Sinai. But even more compelling is the fact that 539 BC is when the Persians defeated the Babylonians and released the Israelites from their brutal captivity. They were in exile from 597 to 538 BC, which was a traumatic event. But even if it was written by Moses, which some scholars still believe, then trauma certainly was prevalent during his time as well. Regardless, it's helpful for us to think of the entire Old Testament as Israel's story that is written in light of national trauma to encourage continued faithfulness to God. The Pentateuch, or Torah, communicates how the Israelites got their start and how God gave them the gift of the law. And it also reminds them of how they failed to remain faithful to Yahweh, who was always faithful to them. You know, maybe the best way to look at the Torah is as if it is Israel's origin story. Like any good superhero movie series, origin stories communicate so much about the characters. And the Torah does this for Israel. This document explains for the Israelites 
this is who we are, this is where we came from, this is what we believe, and most significant, this is who our God is. He is faithful even when we are not. And Genesis is part one of this five-part book. So, Genesis is an ancient story. Hopefully your brain is cemented, uh, hopefully that is cemented in your brain by now. And the Bible as a whole has a story to tell and a point to make. God's redemptive plan for humanity is woven throughout this collection of books, so we can't miss what is communicated at the very beginning of that story. Genesis is 50 chapters long and takes us from Adam and Eve to Joseph, from creation to the people of Israel entering Egypt. And it's all about the beginning of Israel's story, about their disobedience and stubbornness to God, the the promises of land and offspring that were made to them, and the struggle between Israel and God over land and people. These 50 chapters are often broken into two sections, chapters 1 through 11 and chapters 12 through 50. Part 1, chapters 1 through 11, tell the story of creation, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Noah's Ark, and the Tower of Babel. Chapters 12 through 50 tell the story of Israel from Abraham to Egypt, from one man to a people, the beginnings of a nation. You know, when I was in, when I was in middle school, I was captivated by the origins of the United States of America. I read everything I could about the American Revolutionary War, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution. I wanted to know how we began. But then I found out that you get called a nerd by your friends when you care about things like history. And so I focused my attention on more important things like sports and girls. Um, that was the beginning of my downfall as a student. Fast forward to today and I am fascinated once again by an origin story of a nation and how it led to the most important thing in my life and many of your lives as well. A faith in Jesus Christ and his love, grace, truth, inclusivity, compassion, and mercy extended to all of humanity. I love learning about how we began. And you can call me a nerd all you want. Just don't do it to my face. It, it hurts my feelings. Um, Genesis is the obvious place to start. By the time we get to Genesis chapter 12, we discover a man named Abraham. And God promised Abraham two things, people and land. Throughout the story of Genesis, we see a constant struggle between Israel and God over people and land. And in many ways, that struggle continues even today. There is a constant struggling, a wrestling at every point of this story. And you'll see this a bunch over the next several weeks. And it makes sense because the, world, the, the word Israel literally means wrestles with God. And so as we flip to the very first chapter, we hold on to the evidence that this story is trying to connect an exiled audience with their ancient past. The Israelites weren't reading about Noah and the flood or any of the other stories for that matter, to try and figure out how it happened or what really happened. No, they read to try and understand their relationship with God. And so when we read, we need to do our best to remove our 21st century scientific understandings, our certainty about how it all came to be, and embrace an ancient story. The story of Genesis is all about God's relationship with Israel. People, land, and struggle. Okay, how's that for an introduction into the series? Sorry, it took a little long. Uh, go ahead and open up your Bible or Bible apps to Genesis chapter 1. And we're going to start right in verse 1. Uh, Genesis is the first book of your Bible, so if you're looking for it, just go to the very beginning. And you'll find yourself right there. Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now, I want, us, I want us to focus on one word here in verse 2. That's the word formless. The Hebrew word for formless is defined with words like desolate, worthless, confusing, or chaotic. Our temptation when reading Genesis 1 is to dig in and try to decipher how the world came to be, how God created but we have to remember that this is an ancient story being told for a specific reason. And these storytellers don't seem to care all that much about scientific reasoning as to how the earth came to be. Instead, the story focuses on the earth being chaotic and helps us to understand the ancient mindset about how God creates. 
the power and beauty of the Israelites' understanding of how God creates was that God alone overcame chaos in six days. This is how God introduced himself to them and, and to us. Out of a, a formless void, out of chaos, a place totally inhospitable for human life, God tamed chaos to the degree that he made paradise. Now, every belief system in the ancient world believed the gods tamed the chaos. But Genesis 1 is Israel's story about who is truly responsible for that. Their answer is Yahweh. Fast forward to our context, and maybe this little bit of insight into the ancient story provides some hope for you as well. If God can create out of chaos, and, and if what he creates is as incredible and beautiful and meaningful as the world humans have always experienced, what is he capable of in our lives? If he can bring meaning to the chaos of creation, what meaning can he bring to the chaos you're experiencing? Yahweh, God, our God is the chaos tamer. And how does God tame the chaos in Genesis 1? Well, on days 1 through 3, he creates space, and on days 4 through 6, God fills the space. When we view Genesis this way, we see that these verses aren't about God creating the universe or a metaphor for evolution. Instead, it's all about Israel's creative God bringing peace, meaning, stability to the chaos. It's kind of like when our 11-year-old Jericho wants to play bingo. Um, for some reason, that kid loves bingo. Like, I know exactly where he'll be when he enters his twilight years. But wherever he wants to play, uh, whenever he wants to play, we have to clean all the stuff off of our table, which usually consists of a half-eaten Cliff Bar Zakiah left there, a couple plants, some mail, and whatever else we threw on the table when we walked into the house. It's chaotic, and we have to make space from that chaos for the bingo cards and the little pieces we put on the card before we can play the game. You see, before we play, we must create the space. And after we create the space, we put everything in its place. Cards, pieces, drinks, snacks. And then our family, and usually my in-laws, sit around the table so we can start playing. The same thing is happening in Genesis. God puts things in order in days one through three before playing the game in days four through six. On day one, God creates space for the sun, moon, and stars by separating the light from the dark. And on day four, he fills that space with the sun, moon, and stars. On day two, he creates space for birds and sea creatures by separating the waters above from the waters below. And on day five, he fills the sky and sea with birds and sea creatures. On day three, he creates space for the, for the land to appear. And on day six, he creates animals and humans to fill the land. This is the story of Genesis 1. We begin with chaos, and by the end of the chapter, we have air, sea, land, and all the things that fill those spaces. But we can't miss God's crowning achievement in this story. Human beings. It is only after day six that God says what he has made is very good. All the other days, God just says, good. In the ancient world, uh, kings were considered divine image bearers. But here in Genesis 1, all humans have this same royal status. Look at verse 27 with me. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. What's happening right here in this moment is that humanity is given status. Human beings matter deeply to Yahweh. So much so that later uh, Jews wrote stories about angels getting angry with the status of humans. In Psalms 8, 4 through 5, we read, When I consider your heavens... Or sorry, this is 8, 3 through 5. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You know, most other ancient creation stories sounded nothing like this. The elevation of human beings, male and female, to the level of divine image bearer is an ancient Israelite comment on human equality. 
how God, Yahweh, sees human beings and their value and worth. You see, Genesis 1 is a statement that the God of Israel alone is worthy of Israel's worship. The intention of this writing was never to show 21st century people the precise way things came to be or to show a basic understanding of the Big Bang or even Einstein's theory of relativity. No, it was written to tell the Israelites that their God, not the other gods of, not the gods of other nations, was the true tamer of chaos. This God, the creator God who made space and filled it, did it alone. And he is the only God worthy of worship. They used their view of the universe and how things came to be, which had connections and similarities with other ancient origin stories, to say that their God, regardless of what you may think of a captured and persecuted people, is not weak. In fact, Yahweh is stronger than all the other gods put together. Of course, Genesis 1 contains an ancient view of the world. The science and discovery that we know would have been complete nonsense to the ancient Israelites. But that wasn't the point. The point of an ancient story is to tell a story. And they, they did a brilliant job of telling this story. Because here we are, thousands of years later, reading and studying and growing and learning from it. A story that contains deep theology and beautiful imagery that is not meant to be molded to our experiences and understanding. Instead, it is a story that prompts us to enter their world and be changed by it. So, based on what we've learned about Genesis, and more specifically Genesis 1, Genesis 1 that God tames chaos, God creates space and fills it, God is powerful and creative, God is the one God worthy of worship, how can this first part of the first part of the story change us? And when I was a, a little kid, I was, I was pretty chubby. And my mom had me on every diet that ever came out. Um, when you're a kid and you're on a diet, you have to find ways to eat things that every kid wants to eat without your parents knowing. So I had a, a stash of peanut M&Ms hidden way under my bed in like the darkest part so no one could see them. And when I got hungry, which was often, I'd crawl under there and eat my peanut M&Ms. Well, one day, I spilled my peanut M&Ms and had to eat them by feel, just kind of moving my hand around and, until I felt something. Um, one of the M&Ms I grabbed and started chewing was a little crunchier and not as sweet as I remembered this candy being, so I crawled out from under my bed, and, and a few minutes later, I noticed something kind of like stuck in my teeth. And when I finally got the object unstuck, I recognized a cricket leg between my fingers. Yeah, struggling around in the dark made me consume a cricket. I think reading Genesis without a proper understanding of ancient Israel and the story they were trying to tell in their, in their context causes us to wander around in darkness, consuming things we shouldn't. Things that produce a small view of God, a view that keeps God as an object of our control instead of an infinite, creative, powerful God that is so much bigger than we could ever wrap our minds around. Things that cause us to, to divert our attention to the other tempting and seductive gods we have in our lives. Things that cause us to elevate ourselves above people who don't believe what we believe. Things that we internalize and hold on to. Things that cause us to lose hope. And things that cause us to miss out on the truth and beauty and significance of how transformative these ancient stories can truly be. Transformative, transformative things like God's worthiness of worship, his faithfulness even when we aren't faithful, things like the worth and value God sees in humanity that he would create all human beings, all human beings in his image, Things like God's ability to create space and then fill that space. His, his power and creativity to tame chaos and bring peace and meaning. Things that are sweeter and better than peanut M&Ms. And things that prompt questions for us to consider like, how does this ancient text shape our lives today? What does it mean for us and to us to be created in God's image? Why is God worthy of our worship? What is God making space for and filling that space with right now? What chaos do we hope God tames in our context? And I've been sitting with that last question for a while now. It seems like so much of our context and the things we experience are riddled with chaos. And yes, there is plenty that I hope God tames and brings meaning to, but considering this question in light of this ancient story 
forces me to widen my, my perspective and lean into the faith I have in all God is capable of. But I won't go too much more into that because I hope that however you're attending church today, these questions would prompt healthy discussion and dialogue for you to answer or consider together. Remember, these sermons are always just the beginning of the conversation. And because this is Genesis 1, I guess we could say this is just the beginning of the beginning of the conversation. I'm praying and hoping that alongside one another we can process through what all of this meant for those in the ancient world and what it all could mean for us today. That we would be changed and transformed by the Holy Spirit through our intentional connection to one another and the mission God has given this church. Let's pray. Father God, I'm, I'm again so grateful for this opportunity that you've put before our church to meet and gather in smaller community, to get to know one another, to be more intentional. And God, I'm, I'm hoping in the same way that this ancient story opens up our eyes to the possibilities of what you are capable of, that even sharing our stories with one another might be able to do the same, that we would learn from one another, that we would grow together, that we would encourage and spur one another on um, together, God. Father, as we, as we process and sit with and consider um, the intention behind the words that we read in Genesis 1, God, we ask that your Holy Spirit lead us and guide us, uh, be with us in our conversation, and, uh, and lead us to understand how big and beautiful and vast you are, how incredibly worthy of our worship you are, and everything that you're capable of to tame chaos, even chaos that we might be experiencing ourselves right now. We love you, we glorify you, we praise you, we honor you, and we pray all this in the matchless, beautiful, powerful name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen. Well, this series that will walk us through the 50 chapters of Genesis start in part one by saying that we, to really get what Genesis is all about, we need to put ourselves in the shoes of the people who first heard these stories like how a movie or a video game set in the past helps us understand maybe how things were way back then. And hopefully that it connects with you. Genesis is just full of ancient stories and these stories were written for a specific group of people living in a totally different world than ours, but they still have something to say to us. Mm -hmm. And so Steve, I really appreciate this. And I'm excited that you're excited about this Genesis series that, that <laughs> kind of bleeds through. Uh, what do you hope we walk away with just from this whole series? Yeah, I mean, I think so often we look at Genesis and, and we get hung up on like, how did God create? Or how did the world come to be? Or did Noah's Ark really happen? How did all those things come together? We, like a textbook kind of. We do that a lot with uh -huh. with the Old Testament. You look at it as like a, a yeah, a textbook. And or or we'll take it as like this. It's it's got some really sound principles for how I need to live my life. And it's it's like that's written thousands of years ago. Uh, maybe there's some things that we need to interpret and learn from that we can apply to our lives now. But taking things directly from there can get a little challenging sometimes. So I think for me, the, the thing that's most exciting about this is this is the beginning of the story of God. And this is the way that God introduced himself to the Israelites, the ancient Israelites, and how he introduces himself to us. And so um, it's just fascinating to me. Yeah. And I love wrapping my, trying to wrap my head around all of it, knowing that, that because I'm so di distant or disconnected from when it was written, I'm not going to be able to wrap my head all, all around it, but to catch the themes of the stories that are present yeah. are... Well, you definitely introduced some uh, some themes that I was not super familiar with mm -hmm. when it comes to, to Genesis. Uh, you talked about God as a creator who brings order out of chaos. Mm -hmm. um, if I can ask you, how does that view of God as a chaos tamer mm -hmm. influence your faith, especially mm -hmm. in time of like individual turmoil, communal turmoil? Yeah, I mean, I think so much of it comes down to the way in which this ancient story describes how God tamed the chaos and that it was only God. Because I think I mentioned this in the sermon, but every ancient origin story ha had the gods taming yes. the chaos. But the gods, so all these gods came together to make all the things. And in ancient Israelite belief, it was Yahweh and Yahweh alone. And to me, it's such a great reminder of how vast and big and just outside of the scope of what I can probably legitimately conceive with my own with small your little brain. mind. Thank you. I, 
I'm here for you. I was saying it, but I'm really glad <laughs> you said it too. It means a lot to me. <laughs> um, but it's just like this. I it reminds me of of even though I like I'm a, I'm a control person. Like I really want to have control. How little control I actually wow. have. And if God is capable of ordering chaos to create this, what else is He capable of? And it just I think it just expands and grows and and in some ways like colors my faith to understand the capacity God has even more. Well, so. um, you emphasize the importance of gathering in smaller communities for connection and cornerstones going all in on these neighborhood churches. Mm -hmm. how, how can we uh, be more effectively engaged in our communities to meet needs around us? You talked about yeah. that, like that's really a part of why we're doing this and how Genesis shows that and, and, yeah. and helps us understand that better. Yeah, I mean, I think so much of this like push that we've felt from the Holy Spirit to get people in smaller community is it opens the door for people to be known. I mean, it's so easy to walk into any of our facilities, most of our facilities, and go unnoticed. Absolutely. And and I understand that there's certain people that actually need that or, or that's what they're, they desire, but if we understand church and, and how central community is, and actually church is just defined as community, without meeting in these smaller communities, we'll never know the needs of our community or know the needs of our of the people we're gathering with. And so this gives us an opportunity in some really tangible ways for you and I to sit around a table yep. and go, what are you, what's going on in your life? And how can we help? Oh, there's 20 other people here that someone else might be able to help with that situation you're going in. Or we have a neighbor down the street that's really struggling with this. Cool, this is what our church is going to do to, to care for these the, the people that we're around. And it's just so, prevalent throughout scripture in our understanding of what Jesus created and what God's intention was from the very beginning. So, so yeah, I, I love that. I think that's the best part um, of church, yeah. uh, to be honest. Amen. Um, kind of a personal question, but mm. what, what chaos in your life do you hope God will tame? And um, yeah, how, how, how do you have you learned to trust in God's power and creativity to bring peace and meaning yeah. to situations. Yeah, there's probably layers to that for me. I think um, Amanda and I, my wife Amanda and I were talking just a few days ago and of some com communication gaps that we have. And, and a so lot I'm glad of, to hear that. You, I'm not the only one. Oh, <laughs> do I have stories for you, my friend? For another time, for another time. We'll not you know, do that here. Um, no, it's just like, the, there's differences in the way we communicate yep. and the things that we want and what we desire or, or what we're trying to get out there and and then the way that it's perceived is different and so we're just working on that and um for me for that one specific thing it's like i know and i trust that if god can create beauty out of formless voids then with the with the stability and um, time and love and devotion and affection that Amanda and I have for each other, mm -hmm. absolutely he can he can work and move in our conversation and help us communicate more effectively toward one another. That's a, that's a great example. So I, but like I said, I got, there's layers, there's yeah. so many different things that I would say, but yeah, that's probably one that hits closest yeah. to home. Well, that'll be for part two of this conversation. Yeah, we'll do we're, gonna, two. we're gonna record this. You're gonna so. counsel me? No. <laughs> Phew. Hey, Steve touched today on the idea that even though these stories are ancient, they do have the power to shape our lives by showing us what's possible and reminding us that we're not alone in in our struggles mm. and inspiring us to live better. So this series is kind of like a guide to explore these old stories in a way that help us to see that they're not just about the past, they're about us, they're about here, they're about now and how we can live in a way that's good for us and the world around us. It's about finding our place in a story that's way bigger than just ourselves. I'm here for it. I hope you'll join us for the next part next time. See you then. Hey, wait, wait, before you go, three things. First, consider becoming one of Cornerstone Fellowship's financial partners. Uh, your donations will ensure that you'll be able to continue enjoying helpful and hopefully life-changing messages like the one you just watched. And then number two, please share the link to this message with anyone who you know needs it or will be blessed by it or by posting the link to your own personal social media platforms, all of them. And finally, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on the bell so you'll be alerted whenever we post more content. Thanks for watching.